Hi everybody and welcome to the Ambassador of Southern Rock YouTube channel. I'm your host Michael Buffalo Smith. Now we love Southern Rock but we also like other classic rock and lots and lots of good music, books, and films. So look for a pretty wide variety of stuff here on the YouTube channel. If you like us, please, please, please do me a favor. Click on that subscribe button and subscribe to our channel because we've got lots and lots of uh, good videos lined up for you. And uh, if you subscribe, you'll be the first to know about it. It'll uh, come right to your email and let you know that, that you know, that we've got something posted. Uh, today, we're very, very happy to be able to welcome to the program Linda Wolf, a professional photographer with over 50 years experience. Linda uh, is famous for her portraits of women. Uh, among other great things, she's done great exhibits all over the world, award-winning photographer, and what we want to talk to her mostly about today is her new book. It's called uh, Tribute, Tribute Cocker Power. Now, this huge coffee table sized book, it's massive and beautiful, loaded with photographs from the famous 1970 Mad Dogs and Englishmen tour that Joe Cocker did with Leon Russell, uh, Rita Coolidge, and all the other folks that we all love. Tons of great photos. Plus, there's another section of the book where a few years ago, Tedeschi Trucks Band with Warren Haynes and other friends paid tribute to the Mad Dogs and Englishmen tour with a lot of the folks from the actual tour from 1970, including Mr. Leon Russell. Beautiful photographs, just mind-blowing stuff. It's so good. Now, I would like to ask you to please visit lindawolf.net and the book site is cockerpowerbook.com Check out the websites and we would love to welcome right now Linda Wolf to the program. Okay, we're here with Linda Wolf. And uh, good morning, Linda. Good morning, Michael. Yeah, thank you for doing this. We really appreciate it. Uh, got a few questions for you. By the way, the uh, Cocker Power book came, and uh, it is probably the biggest book in my library. <laughs> it must weigh about 50 pounds, but uh, just a beautiful, beautiful book. I want to talk about that, too. Um, with your 50-plus years as a photographer, it's nearly impossible to ask everything that I want to ask. Mm -hmm. but I hope to hit on the key elements, especially with your music related photography. Tell me about where you were born and raised and where you live now, if you would. Uh, I was born and raised in Los Angeles. Um, I should say in the San Fernando Valley, um, up, uh, upper middle class upbringing with um, an educator. My mom is an English teacher and my father was a businessman who had been um, a cinematography major at USC. And I was the only child. Uh, my dad was also the stuntman for Johnny Weissmiller. Um, so he was the original main Tarzan. So he brought me up to play football and, you know, really just be an all around tomboy or tom girl. And, uh, my mom was a, is a poet and um, a great books reader. So she brought me up to, um, so that she could, she, she used to say she, she wanted to be able to have somebody to talk with because in uh, the fifties, she felt that women that she was hanging out with couldn't speak her language, uh, which was very intellectual and well-read. So she brought me up with great books and a lot of art and a lot of political um, activism. Um, 
my mother was um, a strong feminist, humanist, anti-war demonstrator. So, so I was brought up in, um, in a fairly white uh, middle class environment, um, which I uh, quickly grew to dislike um, because of the lack of diversity and the diversity I was experiencing in my teen years in the music industry, particularly, and in the anti-war movement in Vietnam you know, the Vietnamese anti-war movement and the civil rights movement. I was very active in the civil rights movement. So um, I quit my, my upper middle class um, protected lifestyle and moved to Hollywood. Um, moved in with a girlfriend whose mother was very poor, pretty broke. And I started hanging out with my musician friends um, jazz, blues, rock and roll, um, and uh, ended up um, very close friends with a lot of the up and coming um, Laurel Canyon uh, musicians and um, LA musicians. We were, uh, you know, we did love-ins and be-ins and things together where we were really mixed. So there was a lot of mix in the music, mix in the in the relationships and and people, and um, and that was so rich for me. This is what I needed. Um, and then after you want to hear all this, right? <laughs> <laughs> after hear. all of the, that, uh, I ended up becoming the documentary photographer for Fanny, the first all-girl rock band right. to have any major influence. And then from there to the Cocker Tour, and from there after the Cocker Tour, I left the United States and went to live in the, in the south of France for five years. And that's where <laughs> I continued my photographic education. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, you, uh, you answered a few of the questions there in one, uh, one uh, swoop. <laughs> that's good. I, I was going to say, uh, when I first was reading about you, I, was, uh, I had to smile when I saw that you'd worked with the band Fanny because... Here in South Carolina, I may have been the only guy in my high school that knew about Fanny. And I was like, you guys don't know how great they are. Uh, it was like the first all-girl band, right? Well, one of the first to ever be signed to a major record label, yeah. uh, Reprise. I think right. the first. And then, um, you know, I mean, Fanny was and is... Uh, a very important historical music group. And the musicians in Fanny have continued. Brie has her own uh, record album out now. Um, June Millington. And oh, there's a documentary about Fanny about to come out. Bobby Joe Hart did. Oh. Uh, it's been, of course, the COVID thing has kept a lot of the documentaries <laughs> from yeah. coming out. Uh, but there'll be a beautiful documentary about Fanny. Um, June Millington, the lead guitarist, started Institute for Musical Arts, which is a camp, a rock and roll camp for teen girls. That's been going on in Goshen, Massachusetts. Um, and she was very much a part of, uh, uh, she's been a very politically um, involved um, activist as well. Well, uh, tell me a little bit about how you came to uh, join the Mad Dogs and Englishmen tour with Joe Cocker, Leon Russell, and everybody. That's such an exciting, uh, all the way back, back when I was in high school, and my, right. uncle, my uncle John in San Jose, California, turned me on to the Mad Dogs and Englishmen album, and I was just like blown away. I used to, you know, had a gatefold on the album, like a poster, and I had it hanging on my bedroom wall. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was, so just to uh, to know that you were a part of that is pretty exciting to me. And just tell me a little bit about how you came to uh, be the photographer on that tour. Um, well, if I back up a little bit, when I was 16, um, I, as I say, I used to hang out in Hollywood, and I met my first boyfriend, Jay Westbrook. He worked at the Troubadour and was friends with Tim Buckley and 
um, Pamela Poland, Sandy Konikoff, he actually lived at the house called the Gentle Soul House. Um, he was also part of Jackson Brown's band that went to Paxton Lodge. Paxton Lodge is a underground story which people have to Google. Um, uh, Paxton Lodge was an experimental Electro Records retreat center in the Sierra Nevada mountains um, in a place called Quincy, California. Uh, Fraser Mohawk, another underground musician who people should know, uh, created it and then David Anderley who was the head of Electra Records and then went to A&M later um, he sponsored it and David sponsored my going there as um, uh, a girlfriend because what happened was uh, at the Gentle Soul House I met future Mad Dogs folks we didn't know we would be doing Mad Dogs eventually but Pamela Poland lead singer of Gentle Soul Sandy Konikoff drummer of Gentle Soul, who also worked with the band, and uh, Robbie Robertson. Um, long story short, um, because of that connection with the Gentle Soul house, um, Sandy Konikoff, after I broke up with uh, Jay, uh, pursued, pursued a relationship with me and brought me up to Paxton Lodge to, as his girlfriend. Um, and we stayed friends. Uh, so this is 1968-69. So early in 1970, when I was living at Fanny Hill, I got a call from my friend Sandy, and he said, um, Leon Russell is organizing a, and I didn't know who Leon was, except that I thought he was a slime ball, because I had met him one time at a radio station when he was handing out this record of his that he made with Mark Benno that had a... a um, insert you know it was a double album so if you opened it up it was basically a woman's spread eagle naked on a table and i mean i didn't have a good <laughs> i didn't have a good feeling about leon russell i mean i didn't like him at all especially being a feminist just from that i didn't know him at all but um sandy uh called me and he said he needed a ride because leon was organizing um something for joe cocker um, at a and Records Studios. Today was the first day of rehearsals. And that was back in March, 1970. So I said, sure, I'll give you a ride. He didn't drive, so I gave him a ride. And I walked into the a and soundstage and was just blown away. Now, <clears throat> for me, music was saving my life. Bob Dylan was saving my life, jazz, blues, rock and roll. They were, it was where, as Bruce Springsteen said, you know, we learned more than we did in school, for sure, um, about the world, about relationships, about what was really essential in, and, and becoming, um, was birthing, being birthed, a new consciousness. And uh, so when I walked into this soundstage, there weren't that many people there the first night. Um, there were a lot of people on a riser that were the musicians that were just starting to uh, congeal. Um, you know, new ones were being added on a nightly basis, singers, musicians. But uh, the room was just, it was just everything that I'd ever felt um, calling me uh, to my life, to my life story, to my future. And I walked up to Denny Cordell, who was the producer, got introduced to him. And I said, I want to be on this tour. I want to go. And he said, well, what can you do? And I said, well, I can take pictures. And there was somebody standing next to me um, who said, I have a dark room. And I saw Jim Gordon, who had gone to my high school. Uh, and he had a camera around his neck. I hadn't brought mine. I thought I was just going to drop Sandy off. So I borrowed Jim's camera and I took pictures of the rehearsal and this guy whipped me off to his house and we went into his dark room we developed the film I came back probably with wet proof sheets or barely dry and I showed them to Denny Cordell and I said you know here's my here's my work and he was like you're on so at that point I was just like oh my god I'm going on this thing that's going to be leaving A&M Studios is going to be leaving LA in six days and I went home and told my parents, 
um, I'm going on this rock and roll tour. I was living at home at the time. I was 20, just, I hadn't even turned 20 yet. I was 19. And I said, I'm going to, to, on this rock and roll tour and I'm moving into Leon Russell's house tonight. <laughs> and my mom, you know, and my dad were just like, they were floored. I mean, first of all, they were floored by me since I was 16 and I went and I left home. Um, and then when they were floored with me again after I'd come back home and then left home again to go to Paxton Lodge, I mean, they didn't know what to do with me. They, had, they hadn't really moved forward into the next phase of consciousness in terms of the, the transition that was happening in the 1960s. They were barely there. So my mom was kind of like pushing me forward in an energetic kind of way to live the life she wasn't living. But my father was far more conservative and, and he was almost, you know, he was, he was trying to bribe me. Well, if you don't, if you come home from Paxton Lodge, I'll buy you a car. You know, if you do this, that and the other. And he, he, he was the kind of man that when I came home at night, he would, uh, he would sometimes put a flashlight in my eyes and are you stoned? <laughs> Oh my. Yes, dad, actually. <laughs> no, dad, I'm not. <laughs> it, you know, so that's how it happened. And um, it was a whirlwind. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I want to ask you just about a couple of people, you know, growing up here in South Carolina and the only contact pre-internet I had with rock and roll was magazines, you know, Cream and Circus and especially Cream was my favorite and uh, Rolling Stone, etc. Um I always loved Joe Cocker. Just wanted to ask you, uh, since you were working with him and obviously knew him, what he was, uh, what was the guy like? Oh my God. Joe was, Joe was all heart. I think everyone will tell you this. He, I related to Joe on many levels. Um, he had, he had poor self-esteem. And I didn't have the greatest self-esteem, not that I didn't like myself, but I felt like I wasn't thin enough. And I was, uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't Rita Coolidge. I wasn't, I didn't have straight, straight hair and have all the clothes that all the other older people had, older women had, girls had on the tour. They looked cuter. They'd been around the block. I'd not been around the block that much. So, but um, Joe also felt that same kind of insecurity. He didn't like his looks. He felt he was fat. He couldn't like meet the criteria that a lot of the very popular rock and roll people had in terms of looks. He wasn't the right look. So I related to that even on an unconscious level with him. And I think he did with me too, but he took a great deal of, um, uh, so he was very sweet to me. And I had a tendency to fall in love with um, whoever was like carrying the most um, electricity and the most power uh, as, a, as a man. I mean, you know, we were taught as young women that we wanted to be on the arms of these powerful men. And I had a lot of contradiction going on because on the one hand, I was brought up to be a very empowered female and smart. Um, and on the other, you know, what we were told we should be is somebody's girlfriend. So I had a great attraction to Joe Cocker as like just this heart and soul and, and talent and energy and charisma, but he never, ever took advantage of that, which in looking back, um, that was rare. He treated me like the young, young innocent that I was on that tour. Um, and he never took advantage of it. He was very, very dear. And he was funny and he was quiet and he was thoughtful and he was, um, he was emotional. He never uh, dissed anyone, never. But he took everything out on himself. He drank to excess. He did every drug to excess. He didn't sleep. And when he did sleep, sometimes he would just pull up on the, a rug near the front door of like Denny Cordell's house and fall asleep. He, Joe was um, a complex 
man who was not expecting to be in this position. And I, I think he was upset with Leon because Leon pushed him a lot. But Leon, that's what he asked Leon to do. You know, there's a lot of, of, of back and forth about was, you know, why was Leon, why did Leon and Joe have this, this animosity toward each other? What, what, what caused their bright breakup? And there was a push-pull situation going on on the tour. Plus, there was, um, as Carla, Carla Brown, who was Leon's girlfriend on the tour, says so clearly in, in the interviews I did with her, Joe was, was taken advantage of by a lot of people. He wasn't, he didn't have the, um, the same, people weren't taking care of him enough on that tour. But he never complained. Uh, he he just kind of retreated into himself and became quiet. Or else, when he was drinking, he he was different, you know. And he would. It was there were a lot of drugs, but there was I did not see any heroin on that tour. But there were it was ramping up on that tour because we were given stuff. Yeah. That, that happens in the music world, and I can attest to that. It's like, and it, uh, the more popularity you achieve, the more people want to give you drugs. And I've seen, I've seen the harder drugs destroy a lot of my um, Southern rock heroes, especially that uh, just because people was like, you know, they think that they're doing you a favor, but really they're not uh, giving you the hard stuff. I mean, it, it, it's not good, but um, man, Joe Cocker, yeah, thanks for sharing that. I, he's, he's, uh, I always thought he was just uh, one of the most unique performers and one of the, just, you know, you say he didn't, he was concerned about his looks and everything, but to me, you look at Joe Cocker at Woodstock and stuff flailing around, and that is rock and roll. I mean, he is rock and roll. I mean, he's rock and roll. <laughs> That's as good as it gets to me. But Joe uh, gave one hundred percent of himself on stage. Exactly, and he inspired every one of us to give one hundred percent of ourselves, which every one of us did, including Leon. Yeah, I don't believe Leon was trying to upstage Joe just for his own personal betterment, but a lot of people did. Yeah. I feel Leon did his job. Yeah, yeah. Leon was an amazing talent. I mean, uh, and one of the best interviews I ever had was Leon Russell. And it was just, uh, it was so, it was so cool because he was, it was about 12 years ago, I guess. And uh, he said, you know, after about the fourth question, he said, you know, Michael, he said, uh, normally by now at 10 minutes in an interview, I'm making excuses to get off the phone because people are like asking me stuff. And they don't even know anything about my career. <laughs> he said, but I like talking to somebody who knows what you're talking about. So that was really kind of him. And I, oh. I never will forget his kindness to me. Um, just a really kind guy. Mm -hmm. And I love his music too, all, all of his music. Um, so um, what are, I would say, you know, without going too deep, what are your fondest memories of that tour? Things that just really pop in your mind? Well, um, one of them, well, I think my fondest memory of that tour was being free, being able to be part of and belong to a tribe of people that was not, uh, it was hierarchical in terms of like, well, the musicians who was the star, et cetera, et cetera. But it wasn't hierarchical in terms of us all doing this together. It was a true union of people that were all on stage at the same time. Each one of us doing what we did, which was either be, you know, being supportive as a lot of the women were. And people should not underplay that the support of the women on that tour, even though they weren't the musicians, they, they, these are the women that came along with the tour. Uh, they were girlfriends and, and lovers and, and nurturers 
and it was due to a lot of their energy that that tour was upheld and each one of those musicians were upheld so there were and but nobody was was made less than um connie dinardo was nanny to barney and tarka she was always on stage um as a matter of fact barney tarka and and connie and i really bonded and chris and gail and i really bonded um we, we, we hung out, all of us, together in the rooms, in the hotel rooms. There wasn't a, in my experience, you know, maybe other people, because there were, you know, 45 of us and often 50 of us and sometimes less. Um, there wasn't anyone who was limiting somebody from being, uh, from being part of it. So I would say the freedom I had to just be a, a photographer in any position at any moment and the respect I had by everybody as a photographer um you don't get that today i mean i i still do only because people go oh my god you were on the mad dogs tour well you can do anything you want but uh normally i mean anyone who has to do photography today of musicians is relegated to this thing called the pit which i never was um i mean i could lay down under joe's feet the kids were under joe's feet so it, that, I think, is probably the greatest gift that, that that tour gave me was this sense of belonging and a sense of complete and utter creative freedom. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, tell me a little bit about the um, flashing forward, the uh, Derek and Susan Tedeschi Trucks uh, tribute to Mad Dogs and uh, your work with them how that came to be a little bit about that if you would sure um so i i had been uh contacted by nelly nebin i mean i was contacted many times by different people who wanted some photographs i, I retained the copyright of my pictures from mad dogs i didn't sell them to anyone um so i had become friends with uh nelly nebin who is um Rita Coolidge's manager. And she had gotten a call from, from Dave, Fr Dave Frey, Fry, uh, from Lock-In. And they were concocting this tribute show with Derek and Susan and looking for all of the members of the Mad Dogs team to invite to come, anyone who wasn't in jail or wasn't dead. Um, <laughs> So Nellie knew that I'd been in touch with a lot of the women on the tour and some of the guys on the tour over time because I wanted to do a book on them. I wanted to do a book on the women at the tour. Uh, she called me and asked me if, I, if she could put Dave in touch with me to get those addresses and phone numbers to invite everybody. So then Dave called and he said, I want you to come. I want you to reprieve your role as photographer. Um, you can have the same carte blanche you had before. You can be on stage. You can do whatever you need to do as a photographer. And we want you to bring your family. Uh, and I said, well, I have three daughters that are going to want to come. He's like, fine, bring them along. And we're going to pay you. And um, I gave him all the numbers and contact information I had. And um, I was so excited. I really wondered if this was really going to happen. And then it did. <laughs> that was it oh yeah that's great man i tell you I, they, i've seen some video of it it, it was of course i'm a, like everybody else i'm a big fan of uh susan and derek anyway so uh it was really exciting what uh what did you, how did you find um those that couple as far as uh as far as people what did, did you think of derek mm. and susan the best people the derek and susan are the best people um, as well as everyone else in that band. Uh, I became close with Kofi. He became a really good friend of mine. I'm close with Ephraim and Kebby. And um, they, they just, I'll tell you, when we all came together as uh, uh, their group and our group on the first day of rehearsal, 
there was more there was more excitement in the air than I have felt anywhere since the first rehearsal of Mad Dogs and Englishmen. Joe, I mean, Joe had wanted to participate in this uh, tribute, but he had died the year earlier. So there was this feeling of it being a tribute to Joe and to the Mad Dogs and Englishmen. Um, those first rehearsals, which were filmed and will be in that documentary uh, that will come out, because there is this documentary of the, of the tribute concert that's coming out. Jesse Louder is the producer. That, those first rehearsals were even more extraordinary than the actual performance, which was off the charts. Off, off the charts. Because everyone was so excited to meet each other and so respectful of the other. And uh, they were like children, honestly. We were all like kids together. And uh, there was no ego involved. Derek and Susan, who, are, who do not exude ego, nor does that band. Um, I had created this tiny paperback book that I uh, just, it was, I called it a memory book. It was photographs of the Mad Dogs tour. And I had it printed up for everybody, the roadies, the sound crew, everyone in my group, everyone in the Tedeschi Trucks band. And those folks were going around and getting autographs from each other as though they were in high school. <laughs> so you can imagine what it felt like to be in this group of people that were saying things like I heard Leon said afterwards, he got in the car after the first rehearsal and his, his nephew told me, he said, I think they like me. I really do. And I told that to Derek and he said, we were all going, I think they like us. I really do. <laughs> it was, it was amazing. No doubt. No doubt. Well, uh, just a couple more questions. I wanted to ask you to just kind of, uh, tell me what inspired you to put together this, uh, the Cocker Power book. I mean, it is, like I said, it's, uh, it is really a great, great book. And, can be used as a lethal weapon, I might add. No, I'm just kidding. It is yeah, a yeah. heavy, heavy book, it's, yeah. but it's so beautiful. Uh, what inspired, um, obviously Joe, but what inspired you to do that at this time? Um, it's a combination of things. Well, first of all, for a man, a man came along, uh, Dr. John Paddock, and he said, I will give you, he, can't, he loved my pictures. He bought a lot of them. He's a collector of um, music images. He, he said he was coming to Washington State and he would like to visit me and see the rest of my 4,000 pictures from the Mad Dogs tour and the 4,000 pictures from the tribute concert. And he said, um, he said, I will give you a lot of money, free. You can take this and do a book, if you'll do a book, if you'll do a real book. And so having the financial wherewithal to do that, first of all, but then underneath all that was this emotional need of mine to finish this era of my life, to complete it um, by this creative act. Oh, yeah, no doubt. So, you know, there was, it was a no brainer to do. And then I contacted, I contacted my girlfriend who I met on the tour, Mimi de Blasio, who has been a muse to most artists, Dave Mason's old girlfriend, um, New Prince very well. And Mimi is one of the great um, stylists and, and artists of her time as well. And I said, Mimi, who, who would be the designer? for this if I were to do this. And she said, Michael Vanderbeil would be the only one to do it uh, in San Francisco. And I contacted Michael and I, I told him what I was doing. And, and he said he would give me a family discount having, you know, but it was all the money that my, that John had given me. So I just sort of took a leap of faith, put it out there to all the fans and said, can, you know, would you, pre-order and give me a little more money uh, in the process. And um, I sold 700 books as a pre-order. So that allowed me to pay for the printing. I never expected it to be published, but then Michael 
my all these are michaels in my life you know michaels are archangels and you know i've got a list of all the michaels that have come in on this project so michael jensen um who is a media uh manager he was the next step to talk to about how to get help promoting what was going to become this book he took me over to michael madden who is the publisher of inside editions and they said we'll take this book even though we don't even know if we'll make any money off of it but two times a year we do books that um that we feel are really soulful and and so we'll take this book on so now i had everything paid for and uh it was just like like it was just a smooth a smooth thing that happened it felt just completely organic oh yeah yeah well, I did want to touch on just for briefly uh, the the fact that you're um, one of your specialties is photography uh, uh, photographs of women, and I saw some of them online. They're just amazing portraits of women all over the world. Thank uh, you. How did uh, it's beautiful? How did you um, how did you uh, come to make that your specialty? How, I guess how and why? I don't know. I'm, I, you know, it's just, I mean, it's obvious that women look better than men, but uh, what's, <laughs> what's the, what's the, what caused you to uh, move into that field so much? I mean, you've had huge exhibits of just photographs of women, and I think yeah. that's great. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, you know, just like the... Um, how do I want to put this? Just like refugees, um, immigrants, um, people of color, um, class issues, race and class issues, women have been through a lot uh, in terms of not being represented, being looked at as sexual objects, um, female genital mutilation. I mean, you talk about what's going on around the world to women. And it's clear that women's empowerment has been a major important m movement. It and the environmental movement are the two greatest movements of, of the 20th century, I believe, and the 21st century. We're now dealing with so much pandemic and everything else. But women have been underrepresented and underseen. And uh, like, like um, The Invisible Man, the book The Invisible Man um, by Ralph Ellison, when do you really see someone? So my, my desire, not only to be seen myself, underneath what I look like, underneath what, what the world says you're supposed to see when you look at me, I wanted to be seen and I wanted other women to be seen. I wanted us to be seen. What really, who are we really? And that meant that I wanted to have a diversity of women seen. So I wanted to go around the world and photograph women, which is what I, I did. And I did that through the help of a lot of women who supported me through my nonprofit organization, which at the time was called Daughter Sisters Project. I created it for my daughters. It's now called Teen Talking Circle Project, Teen Talking Circles. Um, so that's really, I guess, the ultimate reason is I wanted to create, um, like with, with, with what you saw, I'm not sure if you saw this, there's a video out there called I Am a Full Woman. Yeah, I watched that. And I Am a Full Woman is to say, hey, you know, um, we are, no one gets into this world except through the body of a woman. And women's bodies have been used in war, used, you know, I mean, our sexual, the sexual, sexual abuse, the physical abuse, the physical, the emotional abuse, the psychological abuse. Men, I love men. I'm a feminist and I love men, but I need my brothers to be allies 
to seeing our humanity, not putting a woman down, for example, if we decide we want to breastfeed in public. I'm sorry, but the breast is first and foremost to nurture new lives. It's not just to be some sexual image that is, is used, you know, to diminish um, a woman. So not that I don't think men and women and of all genders and any, any sexual persuasion shouldn't enjoy the body as is. I mean, we went through the sexual revolution, maybe a little too much, but, uh, you know, we need to be able to find beauty in love and lovemaking, but not to the, to the disgrace of women in so many ways. So yes, women, the, the women's movement and the movement for women's empowerment and the, and, you know, fairness and, and, um, equality and, and gender reconciliation between us to have conversations between us as men and women and uh, whatever gender you ascribe to. Um, these are critical to the health of, of humanity and to the health as we move forward in the way that we bring up our children. So there's a lot of work to be done. And my way was to show them, you know, to show photographically something different. Yeah. Yeah, that's thank great. you. Thank you for, for asking me about that. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, well, thank you for doing it. And uh, the, uh, I do recommend that everybody look up that video. I am a full woman. It's on the web. And uh, it's, a, it's a great example of your women, uh, f photos of women all over the world. Some of them are just, I don't know, mind blowing how, how beautiful they are. And it's just, and I don't mean classic beauty. I'm talking about beauty from within. Thank you. That, come, that, that comes, you know, that comes out and it's so obvious. Um, hey, I can be another Michael. <laughs> That's right. I already told my husband I have another Michael. They're all Michaels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, I've enjoyed that name um, uh, pretty much. I, I always hated to be called Mike. I don't know why. I never know. Everybody wants to call you Mike, but no, I'm Michael. Uh, the, um, I bet your mother called you Mikey. She, she, she called me Mikey. Yeah. How did you know? Yeah. You knew that the, uh, immediate, I just want to ask you finally, what your, um, immediate and future plans are right now. I'm going to be a grandmother for the first time. For the first time. Yeah, my daughter Genevieve is is pregnant. My family we live a we live in um, on an island in the Pacific Northwest. Everybody's here. Uh, my mom, who's ninety four, is here. Um, my daughters are here, and um, that's my next that's my next life life experience is is the experience being grandmother and i'm ready finally yeah at the age of 70 i'm ready because i finished uh, i got to finish that whole teenage year thing <laughs> i got to travel around the world and uh -huh. i'm ready and i also have my mom who's 94 who's living in her own home with my other daughter heather on a in a another house on the same property we live in a rural area on the island and you know, I'm, so I'm, I'm looking at um, the great paradox, um, which is well understood by this um, idea, this, this, this kind of riddle, you know, what, what is, what, what's ending at the beginning, but is, far, but is, a, but is far away. I mean, death and life. So death and life are the next uh, big experiences for me in terms, and then, you know, we're all living with this pandemic, Michael. I mean, my yeah. God, the pandemic, the, the election. Um, uh, the upheaval fires. in the country, all sorts of stuff going on in the country. And like you say, the fires in California. And 
we woke up this morning to not be being able to smell here in, in Puget mm. Sound. The fire's all around us. So I think, I think the most important thing that is coming to me is optimism. Optimism is critical right now. Yeah. Supporting each other and being optimistic with each other. Finding humor, finding wisdom, um, finding love, and really being able to support each other through this this time and realizing this that we've been through things before we're going to go through things again and we're going to be there for each other and we're just going to keep living for as long as we can the best we can and i don't know what will come from that in terms of my self-expression or artwork or books or um, you know doing the project cocker project was my seventh book so I don't know, will I write? Will I do a video? Will I do nothing and just be a grandma and be my creative self in that respect with my mom, with her death eventually? I mean, she's not going to live that much longer. So there's so much. Yeah, yeah. There is a beautiful photo on one of your websites of uh, all the generations of you and your mom and your daughters together. I just thought that was just, that almost, Aww. almost, brought, almost made me cry. Okay. Thank but you. you're so lucky to still have your mom too. I mean, that's so great. Oh yeah. She's, so great. she's, she's not, she's, she's a whippersnapper. Let me tell you, she's not that easy. <laughs> and she's smart. So smart. That's great. All right, Linda. Well, thanks a bunch for doing this. I, oh. I wish you nothing but continued success and, 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 and happiness with being, a, I can tell you as a grandfather myself, that oh. uh, being a grandparent is, I don't know, it, I don't know, it's a whole different thing than being just a parent. It's like a, mm. you get to really, really spoil them. Yeah, so, and then give them back, right? And then hand them back, <laughs> exactly. All Listen, right. Michael, this has been a real gift and pleasure to do with you. And I appreciate thank it you. so much. I thank you so much for your time and for your attention um, and all that you researched. Really, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Linda. It. It's, it's a real pleasure. Touch. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Bless.